Um, so I'm first time in, uh, in Romania in the mountains, but I must say that they are very similar to Polish mountains because they are, they are also not very tall. <laughs> so I feel really comfortable like at home. But I think it's not the only thing which is similar between Poland and, and Romania. I think also the insurance markets are in a similar stage. Um, and uh, so today I would like to take this opportunity to show a bit of the examples from Western European markets as a bit of inspiration, uh, also as a bit of showing where we can go uh, in the next few years, and uh, also to, to, to give you some of the flavor what digital can bring to, to the insurance industry. I think we'll not introduce ourselves once again, so let's maybe quickly sk skip it. So um, every year we are preparing a short glimpse on the industries and l looking how far the industries are in the digital revolution. Um, surprisingly, uh, you can see on those results that insurance is not that bad, but we are talking here more on the, on the Western European markets. It's above banking, which might be surprising. Um, in CE, I think, we, sh uh, I think we, should, we are still a bit lagging behind the banking industry and, for example, telcos. I think insurance is a bit, a bit lower. Uh, but it's, what is really interesting is how far we are from the leaders. So if you look on the digital leader, the digital leader is at 61 out of 100. This is the scale we, we, uh, we defined. Insurance at 36. And uh, the improvement is rather minor. So it's just plus three in the last years. So I think still a, a long way to go. But as Michael mentioned, we are talking a lot about, di about digital, but now let's answer the question, what digital can bring to us? Um, and I think I, I really like this, uh, this summary, because here we are showing digital attackers on, on different markets. Um, if we are talking about the CE, I think still digital attackers are fighting for growth. They are not very profitable, so if you're looking on the, on the metrics here, they will be rather in the uh, in the bottom right part. Um, and if I'm talking to the colleagues on Polish market, they all say, I do not believe in, uh, I do not believe in digital, I do not believe in direct, because we are fighting for growth since for 15 years, we are fighting for pro profitability since 15 years, and it's, I think, the first or the second year where some of the companies become profitable. But looking at the Western European markets, out of the sample we selected, 40% of the players were both leaders on the market in terms of growth and profitability, 40%. Um, especially from uh, players from the UK and from, from, from Germany. Um, still, there are some players um, which, which are not growing and not being very profitable, but it's only 20% of the sample. And if we will compare it to the market, on the market you will have I don't know, 40, 50 percent of the players who are not profitable. So, so I think it's a way to go. Uh, I think the, the future is bright. I think there, there is a lot of potential to be captured there. And um, yeah, let's, let's maybe move to the next one. And why digital attackers are, let's say, collecting these premiums, collecting the profitability? I think there is this very big advantage of having much lower costs. So if you, if you compare a cost of production, let's name it cost of production, in fact these are the cost of selling one proper, uh, home content property um, policy in Germany. Uh, the absolute leader is uh, Hook24 with 9 euro. If you compare it to, uh, let's say, the most expensive on the market, it's 70 euro. So the difference is really remarkable. But also if you compare direct players on the market, there is a still a huge difference. So if you compare Hook Coburg to Cosmos Direct, it's 2.5 higher are the costs for Cosmos Direct than for Hook 24. So I think it's not only, let's say, answering the, the needs of the customers who are now being more digital, they are looking for the insurance online, but it's also becoming more competitive and building the competitive advantage of having lower cost of production. And I think this 
page we have already presented in our teaser, but it's, it's becoming really important because many of, of the players failed to transform their businesses. And uh, we checked one of the dimensions which could lead to this, those failures is the engagement of the different levels of the organization. And if you can see here, the biggest difference is on the line managers and frontline employees. So if you want to make sure that your digital transformation will be successful, um, you need to definitely involve people, uh, frontline people, uh, line managers, and it's one aspect. The other aspect is that, as Alexandru mentioned during the, the teaser, it's very difficult for the insurance industry to attract talents. It's also because we are not involving those talents in those transformations. And I think this is a big advantage and also a value proposition for the people to join the, the industry because they can become a part of something really big, of something which will truly transform the industry. And maybe just to close the part on the benefits of digital, um, we want to show those three companies coming from completely different markets, but those companies were, the, let's say, the pioneers of digital, pioneers of direct on those markets. And all of them, because of the fact of being pioneers, they are now keeping the biggest pool of profit. They are market leaders in terms of growth. They are market leaders in terms of profitability. And if you compare them to the, to the peers, most of the peers are still bringing losses. So, those three companies are perfect examples why we believe that digital is and uh, direct is important. And also, what is important uh, to say, let's, let's take an example of German market. Before the revolution, the clear number one in terms of motor insurance was Allianz with 10 million customers. I think at that time, Hook had around 7 million customers. If you will check the numbers now, it's the other way around. So Hook with 10 million, Allianz with 7 million. Just because of the fact that Allianz didn't decide to enter a uh, direct market. Maybe to intervene, yes. because that, that is written in many, it's not fully correct. Mm -hmm. Because I think the reason why Book is so successful is mutual. Mm -hmm. And they have a very different proposal on services and claim services as a mutual than Allianz. In Allianz there were some other problems. And Book 24, um, uh, uh, has uh, as automobiles, I think, has 600,000. So this is this is a, a very small amount. Mm -hmm. So it's, I know it's written very often. Uh, just to, to to clarify that this is not the only reason. Exactly. The book of 24 is the benchmark. To be clear. You're, you're absolutely right because they're doing a very efficient and good job. They're and they're like a village person. They don't do colorful things. They do very down to earth things. I think this is also one of the successes. Indeed, so exactly, it's not the only reason, but one of the, one of the things which helped them to, to become the, the number one on, on the market. But if you look, look also on the Genia Lloyd or Direct Line, it's the same story. Uh, on Polish market, it's not that clear, but we have Link4, which was, uh, I think, the company which entered the market in 2004, and now is the most profitable and definitely the, the cl clearly the, the market leader on, on Polish market. And um, okay, so now we, let's say, had an overview of, of the benefits and now we would like to guide you through what could be the potential ideas to be leveraged in your day-to-day -day business to, to, let's say, take, the, take this opportunity. So let's start with a very obvious example. So analytics-powered pricing. So the direct markets are known for having more competitive pricing, more accurate pricing. And, um, and being to also able to change dynamically the pricing. Uh, uh, so they are taking the examples, for example, from the airlines. If you will enter a website of an airline in the morning, then in the evening you may get different price for the tickets. And now is the reality also for the insurance players, more and more. So they, they apply dynamic price. And obviously, improved pricing can bring significant benefits. Like here we are showing it's 3% of combined ratio uplift, which is very, very, very considerable. But it's not the only thing. I think what, what is becoming more and more important is also the loyalty of the customers. So in addition to having a risk-based 
sophisticated pricing model. There are also retention models and price sensitivity models. All together, they are used to, to let's say, define the customer lifetime value and to be able to be more flexible to attract the customers to the, uh, to the portfolio, especially those ones which we believe that they will stay longer with us. So it's not only risk-based pricing, it's now becoming more and more customer lifetime value. What else is the service the, the, cl the clients are, are now looking for? So it's not only that they are looking purely offline or purely digital, they are now switching in between the, the channels. So sometimes they are re doing a research online and purchasing offline, traditionally with the agent. Sometimes, sometimes they are doing completely um, uh, opposite. So especially when we have the market cycles and the, the, the prices sometimes are going up, so we have a strengthening on, on the market, we see clearly that people start looking for the alternatives. And um, the alternative might be to, to check the price on the aggregator to understand if what we are currently paying to the agent is reasonable or not. But sometimes they are just also finishing the, um, uh, the, the, the purchase online because they feel that the service is good, that the process was easy, and, of, and obviously there is a bigger trust bigger trust in purchasing online. It's not like 10 years ago when everybody was afraid of putting the data online. Now, I mean, we are, we are purchasing a lot of things online. And um, finally, I think what we want to leave at the end as the, let's say, last point is this triangle. So productivity, growth, and customer satisfaction. Those three things, they need to coexist. So we cannot optimize only one dimension of this triangle. So we cannot only focus on productivity. We cannot only focus on growth. We need to touch every, every dimension uh, of this triangle. Why? Because there are huge correlations between them. And obviously, if we'll work on the productivity, most likely we'll improve a bit uh, the productivity also of our sales networks, which will affect the growth. We will improve a bit the uh, um, productivity of our back office, which will improve this, the, the customer satisfaction. But I think just to be very successful, we need to act on all of those dimensions. And for all of those di dimensions, there are clear uh, successful cases of implementing digital solutions. Or can I use this one? Okay. But I think one, uh, one other point we wanted to discuss with you is actually how you can get going. And uh, hopefully this is the, also the more, uh, how can I say, I intriguing part and, and we get also questions. Yeah, I think if we just deliver the presentation and walk away, probably we have missed uh, the point. Because it seems that from the previous discussion, there is a clear understanding that there is a need to accelerate transformation, uh, digital, uh, digitalization, but somehow it's not happening. So I think that would be also, for me, as a, let's say a newcomer to this group of people that meets regularly, uh, it's one thing that I would very much like to, to understand. Um, I, I think I, I showed this slide before. There is a clear uh, development that it's accelerating in terms of uh, digitization, bro both in terms of, uh, of supply and, and also threats from other players which are not necessarily in the room today and are not even in the country, but will, uh, will uh, replicate the successful model that, that will complicate uh, a traditional delivery model. And also the customer expectation. And I am a customer of the insurance industry in Romania, and I know uh, that there are, you know, I could buy more insurance products, but I also know why I'm not buying more insurance products. Um, and I think if we are talking about growing faster than the GDP, growing much faster, I think there is a clear question that we should ask ourselves, what exactly should we do significantly differently than what we're doing now. Because just by doing what you've been doing for the last years, I think there's a, probably a, uh, an exhaustion of the growth model that you, you'll need to revisit. So, um, just to figure out which button is. I think the, the shift is there, and, and one of the points that was mentioned uh, very clearly was customer experience. 
and how customer experience drive growth. Yeah? I think you have here a clear indication we looked, it's not just insurance, it's all listed companies where data was available, wherever the high net promoter score was, you can see the growth in value of the respective company. So the companies that have been able to crack, to have a superior customer experience, they've been able to grow faster in, in value. And what do we mean about customer experience? I think there is a clear point about the delivery model, about how you engage, but there's also a point of how you change the product and how you move from not how you know, the actuaries define the product, but also, um, but more importantly, how customers perceive that product. And also how you embed the insurance product into a broader customer journey. So how is the travel insurance part of the travel uh, journey? How is the home insurance part of the home purchase? And so on. And I think this is the point where uh, the industry, from my perspective, uh, needs to, to go, you know, you're still focused probably on the traditional channels, uh, bro beat brokers uh, or, or agents, and I think the, the complexity of managing a customer journey across different channels, Michal mentioned only channel, I think how you do it seamlessly, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a key question. It's not, and I think the key message that I'd like to get is, when we talk about digitization, solving the technology problem might seem a big thing, but it's by no means the, the solution. So just buying technology and being, being able to change the, the IT systems is not the answer. Um, and happy to debate if there are other panelists that will come later and say that the they have a technology solution that could solve it. Yeah? But we don't believe in it. Um, and I think, importantly, when we talk about digitization, we're talking about completely rethinking a customer journey. And this is a classical example of how you get a client onboarding. You know, not, we took it 10 years back, it might have been 7 years or 15 years, but the traditional way, which was very, you know, paper-based manual, painful for the customer, equally expensive for the company, could have taken two weeks. You can put it and say, you know, it was maybe for your company one week. But now it actually can be done that it takes three minutes or five. Make it ten. But I think the scale of the change is the one that should make you think how you can dramatically improve the experience. And, you know, as Oscar was saying, think about it that in order to achieve this, you've pretty much automated and taken at a kind of zero marginal cost all your internal processes. So, you know, the two things go clearly hand in hand. Now, how do you do this? I think this is the, the key question. Of course, the experience improves. Now, for us, there are four things that come together and it's gonna sound like I've ticked all the buzzwords that you can think of today. Customer-centric UX design. Ask what the customer wants, and I, you know there was a discussion. What do we think customers want? Well, best to ask them, not through a survey, but through the applied experience of you know showing them mockups. What could the product be? When would they buy it? Why would they buy it? How would the experience? How do they think about insurance? How do they think about a specific insurance? How can you make them aware of the need to buy a certain product? Then, very importantly, and this is a point not to be neglected, digitizing successfully doesn't mean taking existing processes that are paper-based and making them digital. No, I mean, you would have failed and the experience will not have improved. The, the digitization gives you the opportunity to rethink how the process should be, and use technology to overcome some of the obstacles into making this process effective and uh, a customer uh, accepted yeah, and liked. And then the important thing, and how do you get it to three months, or how will you even be able to do it in five years? You need to change also the way you deliver IT. 
You need to build capabilities that currently you don't have. Many of you probably rely on vendors to provide the technology and, and, and the software and to make the changes. In order for you to adjust to this level of complexity in a very fast pace, you need to have those, most of those resources in-house. So Agile comes into play, DevOps maybe some of you have, have heard of. And getting also the organization to work differently. So it's no longer about business and IT, it's about business sitting together with IT and, actually, and figuring out a way to deliver that. I think <clears throat> this is the, 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 the key message. Now, the point, you know, now I'm revealing how, it, how we, we actually do this. It, pretty much for one, take one customer journey. It can be claims handling for motor, it can be a policy insurance, uh, issuance for motor, any of these. You can have a digitized customer journey within roughly three months for a given segment of the customers given that drives a certain level of complexity, but also generates a certain value. It's not about doing it all at once for all customers. There is a point about testing and learning what works and doesn't work, and then scaling it up to more customers, more products, once you know it's successful. So it's no longer about spending two years in changing a core system and then figuring out what the value it brings, what is the value that it brings, or testing a new app, and then you know, in, in one year you might see if it's good or not. No, it's literally going three months to the market, and then monthly, if not more frequent releases. And this is how you get most of the value done. You will figure out that there are some customer and product combinations that are not worth digitizing, that the value that they bring for the technology and the effort that they require, it's not justified. So you might keep them as they are today or disrupt and discontinue them altogether. Yeah, but it, it, it's um, basically, I'm hoping that I'm giving you hope. Somehow, yeah, I think that's an important point. It's, uh, and uh, of course, uh, how do you eat an elephant bit by bit? You break the five years into quarters, and then all things suddenly feel uh, more uh, more achievable. Yeah, um, I, I think you know just to give you a sense, this is the scale of the work that we're doing in digital. Yeah, I think we've built more than ten digital attackers in insurance only. Uh, we're serving on these topics eighty percent of the Fortune five hundred companies. So this is not a let's say a theoretical point. This is actually, pro you know, it generates uh, 40 or 50% of the work that we do this year and didn't exist five years. So when you think of the scale of change, this is the, the, the magnitude. Um, I, I think this is the one thing I want you to take from this discussion. You have the option to buy technology, you have the option to try to get the solution ready-made. My kind, kind request, remember this. What works for others may not be the best thing for you. Do not do this. Try to reinvent. Try, and maybe the word is not, try to invent. It will be the best thing for your customers and the best thing for your employees. What excites them, it's this. Thank you very much.